Good afternoon. My name is Kelly Shaco, and I am honored to be the president of the following association. The Association for Corporate Growth Pittsburgh Chapter, the National Association of Corporate Directors, Three Rivers Chapter, chapter the Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Venture Capital, Capital Association, and the Executive Director of the Turnaround Management Association, Pittsburgh Chapter. On behalf of all of these organizations, thank you for participating in today's webcast. I would like to introduce the chairman of today's participating associations. Kenny Ogilvy, chairman of the, NA of the ACG Pittsburgh chapter. Robert Krisner, chairman of the NACD Three Rivers chapter. Mike Stubler, chairman of the Pittsburgh Venture Capital Association. David Duffus, president of the TMA Pittsburgh chapter. I would like to thank all of our annual sponsors, as we could not do this without you, their logos are displaying on your screen. Their continued support allows us to have programs like this. If you are interested in becoming an annual sponsor of any of these great organizations, please feel free to reach out to me. As most of you are aware, annually in January, we host a joint State of the Economy event with all of these associations. Today's webcast will be a new 2020 report due to COVID-19, presented by the region's most esteemed economists and experts. During today's presentation, if you have any questions for the panelists, please type your questions into the Zoom Q&A box. We will try to get as many questions answered as possible. I am now honored to introduce today's moderator, Bill Flanagan. Bill is the Chief Corporate Relations Officer for the Allegheny Conference on Community Development. He is also a local celebrity, and I'm proud to call him my friend. I will now turn the program over to Bill. Kelly, thank you so much. It is great to be here with everyone today for what should be a really fascinating discussion about where we are and where we're headed. You know, for me, this is actually the fifth recession that I've experienced in Pittsburgh since I moved here in 1982 in the midst of the steel bust. And, you know, each time over all those years, our region has managed to overcome adversity and move forward, not always as fast as the rest of the country, but things have generally gotten better as we've diversified our economy across financial services, energy, manufacturing, healthcare, and IT and robotics. Of course, this particular recession is really like none of the others because it came about due to a public health crisis and the uncertainty in how policymakers, employers, and workers respond to all the perceived risks uh, make what's next an even bigger question than usual. So I think we'll hear some of that today from our panelists. Their, their crystal balls may be just a bit cloudier than usual, uh, but I can't imagine a better group to take this on. And I'd now like to introduce today's esteemed panelists. First, Gus Fauché, Senior Vice President and Chief Economist for the PNC Financial Services Group. Jim Glassman, Managing Director and Head Economist for Commercial Banking at J.P. Morgan Chase. Dr. Risa Kumazawa, Department Chair of Economics and Finance for the Palumbo Donahue School of Business at Duquesne University. Jeff Mortimer, Director of Investment Strategy at BNY, uh, Wealth, BNY Mellon Wealth Management, and Avery Schoenfeld, the Managing Director and Chief Economist for CIBC Capital Markets. And we'll begin uh, by inviting each one of our panelists to just offer a, a couple of minutes of scene-setting remark, kind of where they think we are right now in the midst of this, this economic and public health crisis. I'm gonna do this in alphabetical order. So Gus Fauché, I'll begin with you. Thank you very much, Bill. Uh, so obviously, this is a very different recession from what we've seen. It happened very suddenly. The economic fundamentals were very good heading into this. But as Bill mentioned, it was caused by the coronavirus outbreak and the, the public health response to that. What we're seeing is a tremendous contraction in demand in the United States economy. Uh, this is going to be the biggest recession, the deepest recession in the United States since the Great Depression in the 1930s. Uh, but the good news is, is that I expect that economic growth is going to resume soon. Uh, we are seeing restrictions on movement lifted. We have consumers engaging in more economic activity. It's going to be a very steep contraction. We've seen 
Uh, already uh, GDP down significantly, and I think by the time it's all said and done, we'll see GDP decline about 12% from the peak that we had at the end of 2019 through the middle of 2020. Uh, we're going to see the unemployment rate rise above 20% over the next couple of months. We'll see job losses somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 30 million or so. That's about 20% of the U.S. labor force. So a uh, very significant contraction. But then I think we will see uh, the economy start to resume growth this year. It's going to take a, some time for the economy to get back to where it was. It's going to take at least a couple of years. Uh, but I think between the, the efforts that the Federal Reserve has provided to keep credit flowing and to keep interest rates low, with the stimulus package we've gotten from the federal government, including aid to small businesses, extended and expanded unemployment insurance benefits, and the tax rebate checks, that we will see consumers start to spend again as they are able to get out, that we will see an economic recovery, but that it is going to be a very severe but short recession, uh, and we will see a recovery. It's going to be a pretty solid recovery, but as I mentioned, it is going to take you know a year and a half to two years for economic activity to return to its pre-recession level. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Jim Glassman from J.P. Morgan Chase. Yeah, I think it's good to remember that this did not happen by accident. We chose to shut the economy down to promote social distancing, so it is wreaking havoc. And I think uh, you got to keep that in mind when you're thinking about what's the outlook going to look like, because I think, I think this, there is no template from history books that can help us follow what's going on here. This is going to be, it's going to feel more like a natural disaster recovery. And I think the thing to remember is the, the, the upheaval is unprecedented, but the policy response is unprecedented. I've never seen anything quite like this. And I think the, if, if you, if you uh, go backwards and you ask yourself, what's the magnitude of the economic loss uh, when the economy goes down 10%? We're losing like $6, $6 billion of income per day because half of the folks who work at small businesses have no jobs to go to. That's basically the heart of it. And so six billion a day is a lot of money. Over the course of three months, it's a half a trillion dollars of lost income. But keep in mind that the fiscal response, not only the four initiatives that Congress uh, passed, but the uh, executive actions from the White House have all authorized about $4 trillion of money to be spent. And I think the thing to remember is it's not real visible in the economy because the special program we created to help keep workers attached to their jobs, the PPP program, it takes a while to get that in place. And so all that unemployment that's showing up in the unemployment insurance system eventually will come back. People may not have work to do, but they will come back on the books of their, of their uh, employers. But the thing to remember about fiscal, the, the nature of the fiscal stimulus is this is more in the form of income transfers. They're sending me checks in the mail, unemployment insurance assistance, PPP program. It doesn't directly affect GDP, but it builds income. It replaces the income that we're losing by not having people go to work. And I think you can see it's so visible to me. Uh, if you keep your eye on where does this show up? Well, if you look at retail deposits at banks, where the money shows up when the government sends checks to people, retail deposits are up almost about $2 trillion from the end of February to the end of April. And that's where you see the impact of the fiscal support. So I think we've got our hands around the first wave of, of disruption here. I think the more challenging is gonna be, how do we get, what's it gonna look like when we ask people to go back to work and we insist on social distancing? That doesn't really work too well for most business models. So we need to have a vaccine. And when we get a vaccine, uh, life will look a lot different. But I think until we get there, this is going to be very challenging. All right. A good way to sum up kind of where we are. Dr. Kunisawa from Duquesne University, your take. So when the four of us last spoke in January about the state of the economy for 2020, I don't think any of us had an inkling about this is where we would be today, uh, asking what is this and where are we headed? So with a 14.7% unemployment rate in April, and almost 40 million or one in five filing for unemployment insurance since March, I cannot help but make comparisons to the Great Depression and providing a bleak outlook. So just to provide you with some background, um, uh, um, during the Great Depression, the real GDP declined 26.7% between 1929 and 1933, and we reached the highest unemployment rate on record of 24.9%. 
Um, the May 2020 unemployment rate forecasts are somewhere between 20 to 25 percent, with the real GDP uh, projected to decline at an annualized rate of 30 percent or 40 percent in just one quarter. This recession is unique um, in that there is a worldwide pandemic that is still ongoing, impacting workers in every industry with no proven solutions to curb inf infections. There is growing fear that there will be another spike in cases as many um, stop following recommended health guidelines as we saw in some locations on Memorial Day weekend, just as states were starting to open up. And back to the great unknown of human behavior in the midst of a public health crisis. Uh, it's not just economics. Jeff Mortimer, BNY Mellon uh, Wealth Management. What are you thinking? Well, I am uh, not, an, not a trained economist. I am a student of markets uh, and looking at history as a guide. And certainly, as was mentioned earlier by my esteemed colleagues, uh, there is no roadmap that we can easily follow through this one. It is a self-inflicted wound. It is, uh, we shut down, I, uh, the analogy I use is we're playing, we were playing a game of musical chairs and just decided to stop the music. Um, we were hoping that when the music starts playing again, that everyone will have a chair to go back to. We'll have to see sort of how long this persists. But I'm always, looking at markets as well. And I know we'll talk about this uh, down the road today, uh, later in the program, but clearly markets um, are maybe not anticipating a V-shaped recovery, but they are anticipating at least a U-shaped recovery. And I know a lot of that may have been liquidity driven. The, the Federal Reserve and uh, the fiscal side of our government in the U.S. have certainly done an amazing job at uh, launching amazing amounts of liquidity into the system which uh, is, has built, uh, it seems so far, at least a bridge from where we were to where we need to be after a vaccine or better treatment uh, comes. So to me, uh, markets perhaps are seeing something that, the, that most of us are not, and that is either better treatment or even a faster vaccine than most of us are giving science credit for. We'll have to see if that plays out. I'm not a virologist. I'm not an epidemiologist. My wife is an epidemiologist, however, and we do talk every night about this. Um, but so I, I don't paint, I don't want to paint a glowing picture going forward, but I do want to say that although we will struggle in the near term, and I think markets will as well, that I think it bodes well, what markets have done bode, bodes well for our, at least our intermediate term future. O over the longer term, two, three, four years, I think, you know, we'll come out of this okay. We'll come out with a new normal. And uh, we can discuss that more as, as we get to questions. But I just, I, I, um, I'm hopeful that the governments around the world have built a sol solid enough bridge to get us to help from the science side. Okay, I definitely want to come back and talk to you about whether Wall sure. Street and Main Street are really in sync or, or not, uh, and what makes you think one way or the other. But first, Avery Schenfeld from CIBC Capital Markets. Thanks very much. Well, we've got a very good, great panel here, even someone with the name doctor in front of her name. Actually, I'm a doctor of economics too. I don't know how many other doctors we have, but we could actually use as a real doctor because I think when we think about the outlook, it is really the outlook for the disease itself. And the way I think about it is this, we know in listening to the experts that there are a host of activities that were part of the normal economy that we are not gonna be able to open up until we have a vaccine or a cure. So I know that some people wanna see basketball games again, um, some people want to hold large political conventions with crowded arenas and so on. But I think the experts are right that if we do those things, we're going to regret it. So if we take a look at the portion of the economy that was in things like crowded bars and uh, arenas and conference centers and maybe international travel and so on, the kind of things that are unlikely to come back until we have that vaccine or a cure, unfortunately, they represent a significant chunk of GDP. You know, California Florida, you know, those are states that depend heavily on tourism, in some cases tourism from abroad. Um, so I do hear the word recovery, and I think technically the way economists talk about recession and recovery, when an economy starts to grow again, we call it, we've entered the recovery stage. But as Risa pointed out, we're starting from a level of activity that looks a lot like the Great Depression. And we could have a bunch of quarters that look like a recovery in the technical sense, GDP is growing. And a year from now, still be looking at an economy that looks like it typically does at the bottom of a normal recession. So with unemployment, for example, several percent higher than it was when this started. 
Um, so I think that yes, it's going to recover, but even mid next year, we're still going to feel like we're in a level of activity that's a recession. And then the one other point I would make is that, you know, Larry Summers, former Treasury Secretary, drew an analogy to Cape Cod, which shuts down every winter. Nobody goes there. All the businesses close. Then they reopen every summer and it's ta-da, we're back to, we're fine. Uh, but of course, those are seasonal businesses that were set up to live that way. And the economy is not filled with those kind of seasonal businesses. So my concern is that as this drags on, we will lose, you know, particularly once some of these special programs run dry, we will lose uh, a large number of small businesses and restaurants and bars and so on. And when the green light finally does come on, it's not necessarily then such a quick rebound after that either. I mean, eventually we'll rebuild all that, but creating all the new restaurants and stores is not something that's done, uh, you know, on, the, on a dime. So I think we have a deep recession now a long road back, and it's really medical science that's gonna tell us this is all over. The one thing I would say is we'll know it's all over when everyone has found the mute button on these screens, then, then it'll be sure it'll be over. <laughs> I think you're right. We've been saying that for, for the television station. We're gonna figure out how to do this broadcast just about the time we go back to the studio. <laughs> so it's, it's the world we're living in right now. I wanna remind everybody uh, uh, joining us today, first off, thanks for joining us today again. But if you do have questions, you can type your questions into the Zoom Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and they'll show up here and I'll just try to weave them into the conversation. I, we're not gonna leave a Q&A period for the end. To whatever extent we can, I'll try to weave them in as we go along. So that's, that's the game plan for the balance of our time together. Now I'd like to turn to a little more of a, of a discussion around all of this and really focus the conversation on three things. What's now, which we've been talking about already in terms of the economic restart that's underway in all 50 states. What's next in terms of economic recovery in the months to come? And we've been touching upon that a little bit as well. And then finally, what's beyond the horizon, that new normal everybody seems to be talking about. And we'll also begin globally and kind of work our way down to the implications for southwestern Pennsylvania and the Pittsburgh region in particular. So, so with that, let's begin with it now. And Jim Glassman, you spoke to the degree of disruption we've experienced and the enormous intervention by, by the federal government to shore up uh, both businesses with a payroll protection program, as well as workers with all the enhanced unemployment. So is it working? Is it making a difference yet in terms of really trying to push the economy forward? I think so. I mean, it's going to work. Uh, you won't know if it's going to work until we get to the other side and you see how quickly we're able to get back on our feet, because that is the intention of all this. And in my mind, really what we're doing, and it was the right idea, we're trying to put everybody on paid leave. And if you think about what happened, 30, there are 60 million people who work in small businesses. Most of that unemployment we've seen so far are those folks who worked in small businesses. And if you ask anybody who is now getting benefits, how are you doing? One thing you'll notice is this, this is not like a recession. Most people are getting support that's comparable to what they were earning at the restaurant or driving an Uber. And so what the big, this, I think it's interesting that the big worry right now is how are we going to get those people to come off the pay, unemployment insurance back to their businesses? And Rob Portman has a proposal, don't know how um, uh, how popular it is, but the proposal is let's give, let's replace the $600 federal supplement to unemployment insurance with a bonus that encourages people to come back to their job. So I, I really think um, it, 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 the, the whole point of all this stuff, and, and Senator, Schum, Senator Schumer and Rubio both said the goal here is to keep people attached to their job so that when we open turn on the lights again, everybody can go back to work. And I really think we're doing a reasonably good job of that. There, there's gonna be a lot of damage that we don't know about, but I think, uh, and I don't worry that these programs are gonna run out because um, if, we find, if we find out that we've got to stretch time out a little bit, we're gonna find Congress is gonna be willing to come back with a, yet another round of support. So I think, I think we've, got a, we've done a pretty good job getting our hands around keeping everybody on hold, in a flight holding pattern, until we get to the other side. Okay, Avery Schoenfeld, I wonder, you know, to paraphrase Everett Dirksen, a trillion here, a trillion there, pretty soon you're talking real money. 
Uh, what do you make of the steps that have been taken to stabilize things through monetary policy, all that liquidity injected into the financial system as well? So no one would ever accuse a fireman for using too big a hose when you've got a huge blaze. And that's, that's really what the Fed is doing is brought out the big hose. Um, and in fact, pushing into everything other than negative interest rates, which really didn't work that well in Europe. And I think they've, they've done the right thing to avoid that step. Uh, but they're buying assets. They've got rates, you know, effectively at zero. Um, they're holding down the rest of the yield curve with the rest of their bond buying program. And they're even venturing into a little more controversially, actually just lending into the economy uh, where angels usually fear to tread uh, for a central bank. So I think they're doing everything they can. I certainly don't worry that we're going to build ourselves a, a, an inflation problem down the road. We heard the same critics say that uh, when Ben Bernanke was doing QE, when the Bank of England, when the, when the European Central Bank, all these central banks experimented with QE in the last down cycle, and none of those countries ended up with a big inflation problem. The problem really here is the limits of monetary policy. Um, yes, they can deal with illiquidity, they can deal with uh, bottlenecks in the financial system, uh, but what they can't deal with is insolvencies. Um, and, and so the real issue, it really does come down to fiscal policy, the steps that are being taken uh, that we just went over on the fiscal side to make sure that we don't end up with a wave of business defaults and bankruptcies, a wave of household defaults before this is over. Because the Fed keeping interest rates low really can't do much for that. That's really a question of uh, the direct support from fiscal policy. Yeah, and Gus Fauché, I wonder, as big as these numbers are, and we are talking trillions, are they big enough to do what it's go what's going to be required to, to really bring the economy back and, and get it moving appropriately forward? Well, certainly, I think the steps that the, the Congress have ta has taken, that the Trump administration has taken, that the Federal Reserve has taken, they're a very good start. We'll see if they're enough. Uh, we do have time to calibrate that. I think one thing that Fed Ch Chair Powell said uh, recently is that what we don't want to have happen is what's a liquidity crisis, a short-term cash crunch for businesses and for households turn into a solvency crisis, where businesses aren't able to come out okay on the other end, where households run out of income because these programs expire. Um, you know, so, so I think that we have time that the Fed certainly has taken a number of big steps. They're getting their Main Street lending program going, where they're going to be lending directly to, to uh, small and medium-sized businesses. And if it does turn out that unemployment, for example, stays higher than we expect and that the job market remains poor as we head into the fall, then there's always time for Congress to provide more in the way of extended and expanded unemployment insurance benefits. So it's, it's been, you know, very big steps, trillions of dollars, both on the, the monetary policy side and on the fiscal politics policy side. Uh, we will see if that works out, but there are options and there are uh, possibilities that, that Congress can take further steps if need be. I think that's any, any warning signs, and this is actually a question we got from the audience, uh, about bankruptcy so far, any concerns on, on the horizon there, or when might that become more of an issue? Um, you know, I, I think that we'll, we may start to see that over the next uh, month or two. I mean, certainly we've seen some big businesses that have declared bankruptcy. Now, they had big problems coming into this. They were, have, you know, heavy debt loads and so forth. Um, and, and I think that there are more vulnerable businesses. So Hertz, for example, declared bankruptcy recently, but they had big debt loads coming in. And, and, and business debt loads were relatively high coming into this crisis. The good news is, is that on the household side, household balance sheets were actually in pretty good shape low debt levels, uh, high savings rate heading into the recession. So households were in a little bit better shape. Uh, but I think we will see more business bankruptcies. Uh, the question is, is the system prepared to handle that? I mean, there are processes in place that allow businesses to restructure. And a lot of these small businesses that Jim mentioned, uh, they may just decide to give up. They may not try to restructure. They may just simply give up the ghost. And so the hope is, is that we can allow those small businesses, those medium-sized businesses to lim limp along for the next couple of months until their customers start to come back. So we don't see permanent, uh, so we don't see temporary business closures turn into permanent business closures. So uh, Jeff Mortimer, you know, the, the investors are trying to make sense of all this. What do you make of the reaction of the public market so far? You, you touched on it in your, open, in your opening remarks. And do you think Wall Street really is in sync with Main Street, or is there a rude awakening out there uh, as, as the summer wears on? I think a lot of investors, especially people new to this game, uh, 
think that the stock market is a reflection of the current environment. It isn't, right? Just the stock market fell 35% in, three, in a three-week period, a very significant drawdown in a very short period of time historically. It anticipated this air pocket. It anticipated that people would be leaving work. It anticipated those issues. It didn't quite know yet what the fiscal and monetary response would be. So it fell and then it waited. It waited for a very short period of time and then it has begun to recover. Um, we have to look at the stock market as always trying to, it's trying to view the, the world six, nine, 12 months from today. That is how it's pricing itself. It's taking all the information that it has and it is trying to discount, right? It is the common wisdom of all of us, the cumulative wisdom of all of us. And it's trying to discount where the economy will be at, at that point in time. It has, I believe also, if you look under the hood, it has favored US over international. It has favored large companies over small. You're hearing a lot of that talk today about the ability of the, the hose in the US was bigger than the hoses elsewhere, I believe. Our ability to respond and not only to buffer the downside, but to provide uh, support on the upside from a fiscal and monetary standpoint is probably better than, than uh, most countries around the world. You've seen that small companies are running into trouble. A lot of the job loss has been in small companies. Small cap stocks have not enjoyed the, the recovery that the large cap stocks have. And, and one final note, the market is already beginning to separate the new winners from the new losers. It is trying to figure out what companies, both in the way that they manage their people and the way that they provide products and services to their customers, will be the survivors and the thrivers in the next new normal. And so I think there's a lot going on. I don't see a disconnect, right? It, it, the market's just, it's just ahead. And that's why I was talking in my opening remarks that it, it perhaps sees a better future than a lot of our headlines uh, would have us believe today. It's, it's perhaps counting on science to help us in the intermediate to longer term. And so we'll have to see how that plays out. And I think you can even see on a day-to-day -day basis when you get good news from certain firms on the vaccine or treatment side, the market rallies because it's, it's saying, oh, good, we can, right, right, the end is coming sooner than, than we might believe. The end. So again, more to come on that, but, but I, I uh, don't discount, don't, don't think the market is disconnected from reality. I sometimes like to reverse engineer, what is it telling us right now that we don't quite understand about our future yet? Risa Kumazawa, Jeff talked about the winners and losers among companies. There's also winners and losers in this space uh, among workers. Clearly, a disproportionate impact on lower wage workers across the country who uh, have really been hammered by this. What's your take if unemployment goes to 20%? What are the implications for the labor markets and just for the ability of people to, to get back to work and, and be able to contribute? So I think the question that um, economists are asking right now is if this uh, impact on the labor market is a permanent or a temporary one. Um, so I hate to be the dismal economist on the panel, as I always tend to be being the only uh, academic economist, but I have to give you some numbers to kind of give you a perspective on uh, how I see the labor market today. So the total non-farm jobs decreased by 881,000 in March, followed by a, um, a staggering decrease of 20.5 million in April, with the largest decreases felt in leisure and hospitality. Um, the unemployment insurance claims rose from 282,000 on March 7th to 6.9 million on March 21st, which is a 2,300% increase in just week, two weeks. While the most recent claims figures have come down, um, it is still about five to six times larger than the number that we experienced at the height of the Great Recession when the highest unemployment num uh, rate uh, reached 10%. Um, so with this in mind, you know, for me, it, it seems very likely that the unemployment rate for May will exceed 20%. Um, so this definitely has implications for different demographic groups since the gender, racial, and age compositions differ uh, significantly across industries. Um, so since leisure, hospitality, uh, education, health services, and retail, which are three of the four highest industries that experience the highest job losses, are dominated by women, unfortunately, the unemployment rate for women will be much higher than men 
for this recession, which is a reversal since the Great Recession. Um, furthermore, women, and especially women of color, bear the burden of being essential workers who are at the front lines um, of the pandemic, including those that have actually re-entered the workforce as grocery store clerks and fast food clerks trying to make ends meet. Um, we have to remember that because healthcare is tied to employment for many, um, the loss of jobs create additional economic hardships even if people qualify for health coverage under COBRA or Affordable Care Act, which may come at a higher price tag. Um, about 20% of renters already could not pay their rent in April and May, and so the higher unemployment rate would push even more into financial distress. So, I, I, you know, there has been this intervention, uh, whether it's enhanced unemployment, extended unemployment, employment to the gig workers and to small business owners. Is, in your view, is that enough to, to really make a difference and counter these deep trends that you've just described? So, um, so in the academic research, we talk about whether cash payments are better than other types of payments to people. So unfortunately, what happens with cash payments is that you know, people might not use their checks for what the intended uses were. You know, so um, I don't know if it's this my generation or the younger generation, but in my Facebook feed, so many people spent their checks on other things, which is why I started to wonder about what's happening with people's rent. Are they not paying what they're supposed to be paying with those checks? Um, and then you suddenly saw, um, you know, a surge of retail stores with their sales and whatnot. And so it kind of worried me that maybe people may not use the checks for the intended purposes. Hmm. Well, and it's interesting. There's the sort of the stimulative aspect of this kind of federal investment, but then also just the stabilization piece of it and how that's playing out. Uh, we need the stability for, for those jobs for people to go back to. And Jim Glassman, speaking to that, and you talked about the, the significant swath of the economy that, that's represented by the most impacted industries. Uh, a lot of companies, a lot of businesses aren't going to make it if only, I would think, only two-thirds of their uh, customers show up uh, ultimately to, to work again. So businesses that rely on density, what, what's really in store for them in the near term over the summer and in the early stages of a recovery? Yeah, it's kind of hard to see that. And by the way, before we get there, uh, I assume people are familiar with the PPP program. The, the government provided $659 billion dollars to encourage businesses, they'll give them two months free money if you put your workers back on your payroll. And if you work backwards and ask, well, how many people will that help? The PPP program, if it's actually used to take advantage of the forgiven loans, should be is sufficient to cover 55 million people. Most people, the small business community, who, the, 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 the waiters who work the restaurants, the bars, the fitness centers, they, their monthly payroll is about 5,000 bucks a month. So if you, if you work backwards and you ask, if, if that unemployment that sh showed up, the 35 to 40 million, well, that's mostly people who work in small businesses. If they remain unemployed and remain on the unemployment insurance system, then that means the PPP program, there was no point. It would have no impact. But that, that's not believable because if you're a small business, not only are you being given money to cover your payroll, but they're, you're also getting money to cover your rent and utility and um, your mortgage payments. So I think the whole idea behind this was just to give everybody time out and hope that if you were struggling, you don't have to file, uh, you don't have to default. But of course, that's not going to happen. So that this is a struggle. So I think the biggest challenge really, uh, we know that people have an, that the income programs are providing an awful lot of income. And by the way, a report that we're gonna get later this week on personal income is gonna show you the impact of all those transfers that go to the household sector from the government sector. But I think the biggest challenge is gonna be for the bars, for the restaurants, for the airplanes, for the ball, you know, for the sports venues. Uh, I don't know how you, those business models don't work with social distancing. And I suspect that what's gonna happen is that in some cases, people are gonna say, forget it, I just wanna go back. And, and you'll see a lot of people, but like you're seeing now, when, when you open up the beaches, everybody's crowding the beaches. You may find 
that we just kind of force the issue. But I think if you're, if you're trying to follow the social distancing guidelines, for many of these businesses that were shuttered, it's gonna be very difficult until we get over the hurdle of a vaccine or better antivirals. And, yeah, and, and let and, me just add. Yes, go ahead. Um, that, uh, you know, the retail industry, the traditional retail industry was in trouble before this because of the incre incre increasing prevalence of online sales. Right. So we've actually seen employment in retail trade. It was actually falling over the past couple of years, even before the pandemic. So this is going to accelerate the, this process. Uh, and that, you know, that, I mean, it, it's going to cause enormous disruption because it's tougher for people to switch industries. I mean, if that's a gradual process and other industries are growing, then people can shift from retail to expanding industries over time, but we've seen big bankruptcies among retailers. A lot of them aren't going to survive this, uh, and we're going to have dislocation until those people who lose their jobs permanently are able to find jobs in new industries, but that's going to take a substantial amount of time, and that's going to contribute to a high extended unemployment rate. Yeah, and that's become a question that we've gotten a lot at WPXI for our television show. It's like, when will the people who lost their jobs get their jobs back? The PPP and the extended unemployment, it's like the jobs will still be there. You're saying not all of them and not soon. That, that's right. And I, I think particularly for workers who have been in retail, which was, again, was already a contracting industry, uh, it's going to take time for those new jobs to, to grow up to, the, to, to replace the old jobs. And so that's going to keep the unemployment rate high for a substantial period of time. Yeah, Arisa, we talked a lot about hospitality and retail and some of the other industries affected by this. You know, you'd think a public health emergency would be great for healthcare providers and for the healthcare industry, but what is the reality and, and what's the risk to the healthcare industry as we move forward? So the healthcare workers um, have experienced problems that they shouldn't have experienced, being that we're the richest country in the world. You know, first it started off with the shortage of personal uh, protective equipment, for healthcare provi providers, for providers, I'm sorry, to treat patients. Um, and it was disheartening to see governors unable to work with the president to, um, you know, uh, when issues became highly political, including the purchase of ventilators and masks, et cetera. You know, and then there's this issue of inad inadequate testing being done to be able to track the spread of the coronavirus. And to date, um, there are still only about 7 million or 2% of the population that has been tested. Um, when according to a Harvard study, um, 5 million daily by June and 20 million daily by midsummer are what's needed for us to get back to completely normal. Um, and despite the warnings of our top health officials, states have started to reopen their economies. And as I said before, the Memorial Day weekend was a disaster in some places when people just uh, stopped, um, you know, taking the precautions that needed that they needed to take uh, when they went to bars, beaches, and restaurants. Um, so, if there is a resurgence of infections, this will put even more healthcare workers at risk. At risk, and that's what I worry um, in that particular industry. Yeah, I've, I've taken heart around here. We've done some consumer confidence surveys and uh, the most recent one we conducted, almost nine out of 10 people in Southwestern Pennsylvania say they're prepared to do whatever it takes in terms of safety measures, face masks, social distancing and everything else to make this work. So I'm hoping that that's going to give our region a little bit of an edge in all of this and help to protect the healthcare workers along the way. But Avery, you know, speaking of all those protections and social distancing, I, I would think this is going to pose a problem for the commercial real estate uh, industry, the way office buildings are designed and operate. I mean, how do you see that shaking out in the near term as everybody tries to get back to work? So I think, you know, they've got some spending to do to uh, put, uh, you know, dividers in and so on. And the tenants have a lot of spending to do. But I think the biggest issue for commercial real estate is demand for commercial real estate. So we've been talking about retailing. It was a sector, for example, in retail space that was already challenged. We already had malls in difficulty. I think we're going to see more of that uh, with this, at least for the next year, a heavy share picked up by uh, online retailing. That might not be permanent. I mean, I've been ordering groceries and, you know, sometimes they come with the squishy tomatoes and so on. I'd rather be buying them myself. Uh, but nevertheless, some of that share will be retained. And, and so the problem for commercial real estate is on the retail side, we're going to have a lot of empty space. Hotels could be a disaster area too, for that matter, because you know, as many times as they clean and so on, 
people are going to be hesitant. And I know we were talking about a Memorial Day weekend, you know, and I've, I've seen the shots of bars in Wisconsin and so on where temporarily restrictions are dropped and the bar is crowded. But my mind is you can't overrun, override the virus. So if we try to be the tortoise, if we think of the tortoise and the hare, um, the hare jumps out in the race early. So some states are trying to open up really quickly. Um, and I think they're going to find that there are setbacks. And if people start to hear that their neighbor got sick and their cousin got sick, they'll start shying away from hotels and bars and so on, whether the regulations require them or not. Um, so my view is that real estate is in trouble on the commercial side. If you think about anything tied to leisure, anything tied to retail, gyms, you add up all of the kinds of venues that fill commercial space. A lot of them are in the sectors where I think we're going to see, you know, before this is over, we're going to see a lot of business closures. And so you're going to be left with some empty space. Offices, obviously, many offices are now largely empty. I think Lisa has a fake office behind her there, but her real office is probably the, uh, empty. Investment and, uh, Strategy and Institute. <laughs> see, looking at us, we're all in our, our houses or some version of that. Um, so offices are right now empty. And, you know, over the time, we will start to get people back, but it's going to be a slow process. We're not going to have crowded offices again until the virus is done. Um, longer term, I don't, I'm, I'm a skeptic that we're all going to decide that working from home was great. Um, I'll go back to the Aristotle who wrote that man is by nature a social animal. And he wrote that after working from home too long. So I, I think people will welcome the idea of getting back to an office when uh, that's available. There is a collegial advantage of being in office. We will be more tolerant of people working from home on occasion. Uh, where the babysitting falls apart or the plumber is coming because uh, we'll have spent money to do that. But I don't believe that office space is defunct. So I think the longer term outlook for office space is better. Uh, but I am concerned that commercial real estate uh, that's devoted to retail and services is going to see a wiping out. Eventually, people are going to want to go back to restaurants, but all those locations are going to have to find a new restaurant. And, you know, I think that's going to be a time uh, consuming process. So. I also even worry about the fabric of our cities. I know people love online shopping, but if you walk in downtown Pittsburgh, you know, one of the pleasures is that other people are walking in downtown Pittsburgh and visiting the stores and the businesses along the main streets. If you close a lot of that, um, you know, you miss out, you know, even the mall is a little bit of a social space. So if we lose a lot of retailers in this crisis, uh, the cities are going to look a little bit gloomier for a while too. So I think that's, that's the real hazard, not the requirement to necessarily install dividers and things like that in the near term. Well, and not just the cities, not just downtown Pittsburgh. You think about the vitality of small commercial districts, and we have them all over southwestern Pennsylvania. We have them throughout the city of Pittsburgh, still really nice main streets with main street retail. And are we going to trade that community vitality and that sense of place for a big box online ordering world i hope not and that's <laughs> you know i think there's a social value there that is often uh understated people think of the convenience of the big box store with the ample parking lot uh but you know i think the reason we had these little small towns all around the major metropolitan areas that look like small towns still is there was an enjoyment factor to that sort of shopping and they've been very vulnerable in the last year or two anyway they've been gradually uh, running into trouble. And, and this is going to make it very difficult. My suspicion is that a lot of restaurateurs, for example, who've had a good run for 20 years, are just going to say, it's going to be too long before I can have a full restaurant. So you know what, I'm going to pack it in here. I mean, the government programs are helping for the short term. But if it stretches on, I'm not sure government's going to be there month after month to pay my rent, to pay my waiters salaries. And, and I think we're going to get business closures. Yeah, and Jeff Mortimer, we spent a lot of time talking about America and our region, but the reality is this is a global pandemic, and, and that's led to concerns being raised about supply chains, especially all the supplies and raw materials we, we access from China. Do you see major changes ahead in the way companies are going to operate and the way the global economy is going to function? So I think what you've heard on this uh, conference so far is that uh, the virus really didn't is not going to didn't change the world it, it it accelerated the change that was already transpiring and i think the supply chain issue is the same we are already the us is already diversifying out of china was already in a trade war with china a lot of the 
a lot of the world was in a dis disagreement with China and sort of the heavy handedness that they had done over IP theft and everything else that had transpired. And I think now you're seeing another reason for companies in the US to shorten their supply chains. And shorten also means diversify. I think it also, it means moving supply chains throughout Asia. And it also means bringing a lot of supply chains perhaps home. I think a lot of countries now are gonna be very aware of the need almost from a, uh, from a, like a defense and healthcare standpoint to manufacture and produce a lot of these things here at home. Um, as the virus was taking hold, there is now news of China uh, not hoarding, but not exporting some of the materials uh, because they needed it for themselves like any country might do. So I think it's just, it redefines, it gives another reason for bringing jobs perhaps back into the US and to perhaps have a more diversified economy here with more jobs, more manufacturing. It's very interesting how this is playing out. Um, and I think that will be a global phenomenon. I think that will be part of the new normal, not just in the US, but across uh, Eastern and Western Europe, potentially Western Europe, um, and even getting into some of the emerging markets. So it's just something as investors, we have to be cognizant of uh, this new normal and all the ways that it will inf infiltrate our decision-making processes going forward. So I'll put in a, club, uh, a plug for my TV show. We're tackling the global supply chain topic Sunday at 11 on Channel 11 on our region's Great. business because it's a big issue that we all need to be thinking about. Jim Glassman, we've talked about a lot of different sectors. I do want to touch on higher ed. Uh, in a lot of colleges and universities trying to figure out what they're going to do in the fall. Um, and we've got a lot of colleges and universities around here in our region, 35 of them, that really prop up and support uh, the, the, the economy. Well, what's at stake for higher ed in all of this? You know, we weren't really thinking about this when we started. Um, in my book, higher ed contributes about 4% of GDP. Uh, there's 5,300 5, colleges and universities. They touch a lot of communities. And I think if there had been a widespread decision to shut down or not open for the fall, or I think it would have been a next another wave of uncertainty that we'd have to deal with. But I think more and more we're getting the impression that schools are trying to figure out how to uh, stay open, but just um, pursue social distancing type of practices. So, so in the Northeast, um, they're having to think about uh, finding more student housing so they can spread people out. Uh, I don't know, I, you know, that's not the only aspect of the day a student's life. So, you know, when you go to class, you go to the bar, you go to the restaurant, it's, it's hard to believe that's going to be the answer. Some areas like um, Southeast, what I've heard is what they're looking at is they're going to open. They're not that concerned about the healthy students, but for the students that are vulnerable, have disabilities, they're, they're focusing on trying to make uh, things safer for them. So I think, I think they're, I think we're going to find that the schools are just going to work harder to um, figure out how to make the environment safe for people, but not not close down. I think if the closing down would be just a nightmare for the students that are in the process and for the communities that depend on the revenues. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dr. Kumasawa, since you're our academic economist, what's your take on, on what all this means to higher ed? So higher education leaders like myself had already been discussing ways to deal with an impending problem called the enrollment cliff, um, which is expected to occur in 2025 due to the steep decline in births uh, that came about from the Great Recession. And the enrollment is supposed to expect it to decline as much as 15 percent from 2025 since birth rates have never uh, recovered um, despite the Great Recession ending. And as if this were not a problem enough for us in Pennsylvania, um, we had already been seeing a steady decline in annual enrollment, totaling about 20% since 10 years ago. Um, then the coronavirus pandemic occurred, prompting universities to abruptly close and switch to online delivery of classes on really short notice, uh, despite the fact that most faculty had no experience doing so. Um, we have seen in recent weeks that despite higher education being generally immune to recessions, many universities experienced significant revenue losses and budget cuts that prompted pay cuts of the highest paid. So this would include athletic coaches and administrators. 
And then some universities are even laying off staff and faculty, regardless of their tenure status. Um, universities are cautiously making announcements these days about how they will reopen, and they range from uh, going back fully face-to-face, -face, going the other extreme, going fully online again, or some hybrid combination of both. Um, and even more difficult to address, I think, is how social distance can, uh, distancing can be achieved in dorm rooms and cafeterias, um, which are large revenue sources for universities. I read an interesting interesting article in the USA Today uh, yesterday about the survey that was reported um, where 60% of parents responded that they will probably not send their children back to school even if they reopen fully in the fall. Mm. A lot of implications for schools that are already on the bubble and for the communities that rely on them, for sure. Uh, we're in the home stretch now, a little less than 10 minutes left, and I'm going to give everybody a chance for some a closing remark and kind of a prognostication of, of what's over the horizon. But before we do that, Gus Boucher, I just do want to touch on the other big issue that's out there that we really haven't talked about, and that's the implications of all of this uh, for tax revenue for state and local government. Uh, there would seem to be a lot at risk, uh, certainly here in our region, but really across the nation in that respect. Should we be concerned about uh, absolutely. the government? Uh, you know, we're going to see declines in the major revenue sources for state governments and local governments. So uh, income taxes, if people lose their jobs, they're not going to be paying income taxes. And then sales taxes. Uh, retail activities we've discussed is down tremendously. So there are going to be big budget holes for state and local governments. Uh, the, and, uh, the, the CARES Act did provide some aid for state and local governments, but I think that that's an issue that's going to, that Congress will definitely need to revisit. It's going to be a problem throughout the country, so I think there'll be strong popular support. One of the reasons the recovery from the Great Recession in 2008-2009 was disappointing was because although the, the overall economy was going, we, we saw budget cuts at the state and local level that really held back the recovery then. And so I think that that could happen this time around if we don't see more aid from the, from the federal government. And that's going to be a problem in, in Pittsburgh, Allegheny County, Pennsylvania, but it's going to be a nationwide issue as well. Okay, so back to the feds. What's another trillion or so, whatever it takes <laughs> to keep state and local government going? Well, with that, I want to I want to turn to the easy part of all of this. Uh, basically, ask each of you uh, what's over the horizon. You know, what's what's the economy in the world that we're going to be living in as the pandemic uh, eventually comes to an end? So, give each of you a minute, minute and a half to kind of give us look in your crystal balls and let us know what you see out there. Avery Schenfeld, I'll, I'll begin with you. So you hear a lot of things, the world will never be the same. Uh, and I certainly remember that also after 9-11, no one will fly or go to work in a tall building anymore. Um, I think World War I was called the war to end all wars. I remember I was 11, the Berlin Wall fell and Russia was gonna be a democratic capitalist country after that. Um, so the tendency actually is for the world to change less than people always think it will in the middle of a crisis. Nevertheless, I do think there will be some legacies here. We heard about the fact that maybe the China-US uh, friendship, uh, which is on again, off again, will be off again. I think there's some reasonableness to that forecast. I don't think we'll be uh, making low-end t-shirts in uh, Manhattan the way we used to. So we'll, we'll move stuff from China to other low-wage countries in some cases, uh, but we will have different supply chains, maybe not all back to the US. Uh, my view is that we will go back to our offices. Most people will do that. Uh, but market share the gains that we've seen for online, they won't hold on to all of this, but they'll keep a bit of it. So that's going to feel a little bit different too coming out of this um, than it was going into it. So there, there are some changes. Um, and then the other thing I would say is that to get really back to normal is going to be a slow process. So if we assume, for example, that we've all been vaccinated at the end of 2021, uh, 2022 will be a great growth year. But if you look back after big recessions, it, um, it takes a long time, if ever, to get back to the growth path you were on before. So in fact, after the Great Recession, which now doesn't seem so great compared to this one, uh, the 2008 recession, we got back to the former trend growth rates, but actually we never closed the gap. If you looked at the trend line for GDP, that we created a new trend line under it and never closed it. There was a hole left from a, lot, a few years of weak capital spending, for example, people lose skills, they have to shift to something else. Uh, I think unfortunately that's gonna be the legacy here too, where we get back to good growth, 
Uh, we get back to mostly normal life the way it looked in 2019, uh, but there is some longer term damage uh, from this. Yeah, all I can think of is, uh, is the steel bus here in Pittsburgh almost 40 years ago when I came here. 20% uh, unemployment around here, or close to it, so not too many dissimilarities, and 13 years of subpar employment relative to national averages. So this is a deep hole. Jeff Mortimer, how do you see it moving forward? Similar to Avery, I think uh, he hit a lot of the points that I, I, would, I would also share. Um, it's interesting to note uh, a short memories and maybe even a celebratory burst of growth after we come out of this. I'm reminded that the Spanish flu of 1918, and that came in three rounds, by the way, um, it was followed by the Roaring Twenties. And I wonder if those two are related or not. Perhaps people were so relieved that that had finally sort of run its course that they went out and celebrated. Um, so I think there will be some of that. But I think the problems that existed before the pandemic began will exist, unfortunately, afterward as well. Inequality within this country, which has been exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, su supply chains and, and, right, economies like change. They don't, economies don't mind change as long as, they can, as long as they are slow and you can adapt to it sort of in real time. What economies do not like are shocks. And I think this one will leave its mark. That said, however, I still believe, again, that we are a resilient, short memory species, <laughs> and we, we will come back from this. I can remember after 9-11 as well that who would ever work in a tall building, and, and we do forget those types of things. I think once we feel safe from this, we will demand from our governments around the world that we are a lot better prepared for the next one, next time this comes around, um, and that will, of course, be costly, just like TSA and everything else was after 9-11. But I think we will recover. Every crisis has been a buying opportunity in, in an as, from an asset perspective, asset allocation perspective. Every crisis up to this one has, been, has led to a buying opportunity, has been a buying opportunity in its depths. And I think this one too will prove to be no different. All right, Risa Kamazawa. So I think that because this is a health crisis first and foremost, um, until we solve that part, it will be very hard for us to, um, you know, start the recovery process. And, you know, this pandemic showed how fragile our economy is and that we're, we, you know, plummeted into this uh, crazy rates of unemployment that we had not expected considering we just hit the, um, the best uh, economy uh, in, a, in a while, um, you know, and for us to climb back up from the 20% plus unemployment rate, I don't think it's going to be a, a quick climb to where we were, but it's going to be a kind of a slow, painful climb that could possibly take up to 10 years if you compare what happened during the Great Depression. Um, and uh, we'll eventually get there, but things will not look the same. Um, for one, I think consumer spending is going to look very different because people have started to save more and started to spend uh, more frugally to deal with both the economic and the uh, health crisis at the same time. Um, and then I think some industries will turn out looking very different when we come out of this, um, including leisure and hospitality, uh, also education and retail. Um, and I think those were already sort of starting to go through some changes already, but I think the pandemic definitely uh, you know, forced us to go in that direction. But uh, I'm hopeful too that we'll eventually get there. Yeah, I, I have wondered, is will we learn the lessons from this that our parents, uh, grandparents and great grandparents learned from the Great Depression? And will it affect our behavior and our decisions for, for many years to come as, as it did in their lives? Jim Glassman, what are you thinking about what's around over the horizon? You know, um, I'm in the camp with the equity market. This is not your father's recession. It's not gonna be your father's recovery. When we came into this, the economy was in spectacular shape and the Federal Reserve officials love to tell you that we're in a good place. The big mystery for all of us is we found an economy that got to three and a half percent unemployment without inflation problems. To me, that's a fundamental, a fundamental um, revelation. And so I think uh, we're gonna work very hard as Jay Powell said to uh, America, this is not your fault. And we're gonna do everything 
we're going to do everything within our power to get people back. And I personally think within two years, we'll be back where we were in February. But, and, and personally, I think we're very, well, I think we learn a lot by going through shocks like this. And, you know, we make our systems better because of the mistakes we make. It, it, when, when you go through shocks like this, it exposes the weaknesses. And one thing we're learning is that our private healthcare system was not capable of managing a pandemic on top of an already burdened system from the flu season. And I really think that one of the good things that's going to come out of this is the healthcare system has been one of the slowest to absorb innovation. And I think that what we're going to find is that uh, we had to take this path because our healthcare system wasn't capable and it doesn't take a whole lot to do that. And I think uh, what we're going to find is that there's going to be more uh, there's going to be more effort to try to improve the capability of the healthcare system. I have a lot of clients who tell me there's so many great treatments for dealing with pneumonia. You're going to see a lot of advances in that area because this crisis it it doesn't take a lot to to make a healthcare system handle this kind of a, a challenge that we should never have to go through another time where you have to shut down the economy just to lower the curve and to ease the burden on the hospital system. So I think good things are gonna come out of this. And I don't think a lot of the things that were contributing to where the equity market is, contributing where the economy is, all the innovation that's going on, the globalization that's going on, um, the good performance of the US economy that gave us very little inflation with low levels of unemployment. To me, those have not changed. And I think when we get over the healthcare, when we get the vaccine, we're going to quickly go back to where we were. Okay, so we've got our, 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 our opportunity bounded now. Two years for Jim Glassman and 10 for Risa on the outside. So somewhere in there, right, the world returns to, to normal. Gus Roche, I'll let you have the last word. What's in, what's in your crystal ball? Well, well I, I think this demonstrates how much there is that we don't know that's out there because this isn't a typical recession. And so much of it depends on things that are outside of the economic realm. When will we get a vaccine? Uh, do we get a vaccine? Will there be a second wave? And, and so when I go out and talk with people about our uh, forecast and that we do expect to see recovery starting later this year and, and back to the level of GDP by the second half of, of 2021, I tell people to take that with a grain of salt because so much depends on what happens outside of this, how many businesses close, all of that. There is just so much uncertainty out there that makes forecasting in the current environment terribly difficult. The second thing is I get a lot of questions, should we be, be worried about inflation? People seeing food prices going up and so forth. I think you should be more worried about the potential for what we call deflation, which is where prices are broadly falling in the economy right now than inflation. And I think the Federal Reserve is more worried about deflation. Deflation can be terrible for economy. People put off purchases because they think prices will be lower in the future. That can exacerbate downturns. I don't think deflation is going to happen in the current environment. I think we may see prices fall for a quarter or two and then start to recover as the economy recovers. But certainly yeah. that the potential of that is, is, is so terrible that I think we need to be on guard. And, and fortunately, I do think that the Federal Reserve is being very aggressive in, in combating potential, any potential deflation that might be out there. All right, Gus Fauché, thanks so much. And, and on behalf of the ACG Pittsburgh chapter, the NACD, Three Rivers chapter, PVCA, and the TMA Pittsburgh chapter, I'd like to thank Risa, Gus, Jeff, Jim, and Avery for serving as today's speakers. Uh, I thought it was a fascinating discussion. I also think we've just kind of scratched the surface of understanding what's going on and what it really means going forward. So we're all going to experience that together, I suppose. Uh, we would like to gather some information from each participant in today's call. So please uh, fill out the brief survey that you see in the chat section on your screen. Should only take a few moments and we really would. Uh, appreciate your feedback. And, and also, please watch your email for more upcoming program announcements for each association. And again, thank you all for attending today and enjoy the rest of your day. Where is the leave? Oh, there we go. See you guys. <laughs>